My name is Marina Antunes, president of Vancouver ACM SOGRAPH and the Spark CG Society. And I'm very, very pleased that you're with us today for animation and immersion for public spaces with NGX Interactive. Before we get into today's panel, I just wanted to start by thanking our sponsors. Our Terabyte sponsor, Creative BC, our Megabyte sponsors, Animal Logic and Caplano University, our Kilobyte sponsors, Atomic Cartoons, Braun, Teaneg, Image Engine, Industrial Light and Magic, and Mainframe Studios. Our Byte sponsors, CMPABC, DigiBC, Scanline VFX, The Little Deaf Shop, and The Vancouver Film School, and our partners, ACM SIGGRAPH. I also want to take the time to uh, remind everyone that Spark FX 2023 is around the corner. This is our first Spark FX back in person since 2020, so it's pretty exciting. It's taking place uh, March 17th to the 19th at the Roundhouse Community Center uh, with the career fair on Saturday the 18th. And registrations for the career fair for attendees are going to open uh, in February, so in just a couple of weeks' time. Now, let's get to today's main event. I want to take a moment to thank and welcome our speakers today. Alex Greenberg, Head of Animation, Fran Little, Animation Production Manager, and Ray Elemento, Lead Motion Graphics Artist at NGX. And I'm going to pass it over to Alex, who's going to take us on a ride. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good to be here. Thank you, Marina. Welcome to Animation and Immersion for Narrative Spaces. My name is Alex Greenberg and I'm the head of animation at um, NGX. So first of all, who we are. Um, if you read our website, it says that we create mediums for storytelling, for experience design. What does it really mean? It means that we utilize all the available to us mediums and platforms to create compelling visuals while making sure that the storytelling and experience is really the main force that drives our ideas. Just a short agenda for today, uh, we'll do a bit of introduction to who we are, what is it we, that we do, and we'll talk about two projects. One is the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum uh, that mentions in Testimony Theater, and the other one is the Xylem Reservoir, uh, an audiovisual spatial experience. We are a creative technology studio. So we partner up with clients to reimagine what is possible in physical and digital spaces all around the world. And really focused on people and fueled by that collaboration with the artists, um, we activate storytelling, the art and technology to inspire, to inspire and engage. If you look at this collage, this really shows only a partial range of the work that we do. And our team designs the experiences all the way from ideation to conceptual design uh, creating innovative tech, wide range of visuals, as you can see, all the way through uh, uh, installations, public spaces, all around the world. So today we're uh, really hoping to give you a small glimpse on what is it that we do, how do we combine animation in any form, uh, 2D, 3D, and everything in between, uh, and immersion. So we can bring it to spaces around the world. And looking at the work, uh, I really like to say this is where we differ from other uh, from traditional animation and visual effects companies. Um, our work ranges from the most basic 2D motion graphics to complex and fairly realistic 3D animation that can be projected on uh, 360 uh, spaces or um, on, on a screen in front of you. Now, this type of work really makes our uh, lives very challenging and difficult, but it's also extremely exciting because uh, we approach every new project with uh, these exciting challenges and try to figure out how do we do this, how do we approach it, what is the pipeline, what is the visual, what is the story. Um, generally, our projects last uh, up to a year, and the actual production of 2D and 3D, probably around seven to eight months, but it really depends on the size of the, of the project. Quick uh, introduction to our speakers today. You met me, I'm the head of animation at uh, NGX. I'm responsible, uh, aside from running the animation department, I'm responsible, uh, I'm responsible for pipeline development at the studio and I'm leading the bigger 2D and 3D projects um, at the studio. And aside from that, as an artist, I'm really passionate about uh, loop dev. This is what I do, this is what I specialize, this is what I've been doing for close to 20 years. Um, 
lighting, shading, and that's sort of my role on some of the uh, projects that I work on. Uh, we have Fran Little, who's our animation production manager, who's going to be speaking next. And we have Ray Elementa, who's our senior 3D motion graphics artist, who's going to be speaking after that. So at this point, I'll pass the mic to Fran. Thank you Hi. so much, Alex. And hello, everyone. As he says, I am Fran Little, and I'm the animation production manager here at NGX. I'm a relatively new hire. I just started in the summer of last year, and these past few months have been extremely exciting for me. My role was newly added to the company, and I was brought in to help build and maintain the non-creative sides of our growing animation team. So the creative side, these two over here, can uh, basically focus more on what they do best. So what does my role mean? Well, I work hand in hand with both the animation production teams of NGX to help guide them in resourcing, scheduling, building pipelines, and developing processes. And that may not sound very exciting to some of you, but I assure you, I really do enjoy it. Um, but that's enough about me. I'm here to tell you a little bit more about NGX, who we are as a company, and how we do the work that we do. So where do we do our work? Well, we play in four main sectors of the industry. We work in the cultural spaces like Science World here in Vancouver or overseas with the Grand Egyptian Museum. In these spaces, we strive to make exhibits that impact education and understanding on a global scale, and we take pride in the hand we have in making these experiences both interesting and powerful. In the healthcare sector, we've recently worked with BC's Children's Hospital. And while working in these kinds of spaces and these kinds of projects, we've learned the importance of creating experiences that are both fun and colorful to help bring light and distraction from the difficulties brought on by hospital environment and the stresses that can bring to patients. And in the corporate and themed attraction spaces, like our work with Autodesk and Mattel, we have the opportunity to work with cool and engaging companies and build experiences that point us towards a better and brighter future. So what makes us unique? Well, first off, the opportunities we have to work across the globe with clients and artists to tell diverse and unique stories. Already in my short time with NGX, I've worked on projects in Egypt, the UAE, the UK, and Canada. And in these few months, I've learned more about their culture and history than I have in my three years of high school world history class. There are so many wonderful stories to tell in this world, and getting to be a part of making and sharing them with everyone is extremely, extremely cool. Secondly, our portfolio is as diverse as our client base, and no two projects feel or function the same. We build experiences and create art in all formats and varieties, as you saw with Alex's image earlier. The goal is that wow moment that moment that makes you stop and just admire what you're seeing. If we can use art and animation or technology to push the envelope and surprise the viewer and leave a lasting impression, then that's how we know we've done our job. Lastly, growth. Everyone has room to grow and reflect that as both individuals and as a small company. Year after year, we grow in the goals we set for ourselves and the number of projects we take in and in the size of our workforce. This room for growth provides us with so many opportunities. The opportunity to chase new projects in places we have yet to go, for each of our team members to learn new skills, create and fill new positions, and share their knowledge and experience, and to grow our internal culture and diversity and leverage that strength into positively impacting our team, the projects we create, and the world as a whole. So how does that team work? Well, we run an internal team of multifaceted artists and creators that are supported by a talented network of freelancers. That basically means that if we don't know how to do something yet, we can absolutely learn how to do it. And if we can't, then we know someone who does. We need to be ready and able to tackle the creation of any form of media to make previously unthought of ideas a reality. And our team's skill set reflects that need. Not only does this flexibility mean that our team can be part of multiple projects, it also means that their ideas and execution are founded from an understanding, or are founded from understanding of various perspectives. We want creators, not cogs. Cogs only serve one purpose in a machine, but a creator has a hand in every aspect of its manifestation. And this is how we see our team members. If we trust you to work with us on a project, then we're, we value your ideas and input across every step of the way, not just for your ability to take in information and spit out a product. Feeling like your ideas matter means you'll care, and caring is the most important ingredient to making something that's incredible. Our pipelines, much like our work, need to be adaptive and ready to roll with the punches. Every project presents a new challenge for us to solve, and if we tried to maintain a rigid traditional pipeline, we would lose the fluidity necessary to adapt to the needs and expectations of each new project. Many animation studios function on consistency and are built to plug each new project into an existing pipeline, like a train on a linear track that has a number of cars. They load up and head down the same straight track that they traveled on for years. We, however, are built more like an explorer ship, made to navigate unknown waters and adapt quickly to whatever may cross our path. Whether or not there's smooth sailing ahead or krakens beneath, we are equipped to handle it. 
But now it's time for me to hand it over to two of our most creative explorers who will show you two very interesting examples from our portfolio. One, a beautiful cultural piece from Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, and the other from our corporate portfolio, the Xylem Project for Reservoir. We're hoping these two projects will give you a glimpse into how diverse and experientially impactful our work can be. Alex, take it away. Thank you, Fran. Uh, so the first project that uh, we wanted to talk to you about is the uh, Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, uh, the Dimensions and Testimony Theater. Um, just a brief overview of some of the points that we'll, we'll be covering. We'll talk about the project context, um, the experience itself, visual exploration that went into creating this uh, project. How do we utilize VR and Unreal 5 in our pipeline? And things that's a very important point for us, at least to, to, um, to communicate and to, to show off. And then we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, our pipeline, <clears throat> excuse me, animation pipeline from uh, concept to render. Uh, what tools did we use when it comes to 3D? What did we use uh, in, in post, 2D comp, and, and so on. Uh, on this project, we worked together with the USC Shaw Foundation Dimension and Testimony to bring the experience to the museum. Uh, USC is a nonprofit dedicated to making audiovisual interviews with survivors of Holocaust and other genocides. Now, NGX's role for this specific exhibit in the museum was to create an introduction experience, um, we called it an, an, an intro, which followed by the meeting with one of the virtual survivors. And the key part, uh, that meeting itself, um, was designed by the Shoah Foundation. Um, a little bit to expand on the tech, because I think it's, um, in my opinion, it's really interesting, a really interesting way to preserve these memories. Uh, so each survivor gets to tell their stories, talk about their lives for hours and hours and hours. Uh, at the same time, they're being filmed, as you can see, in a 360 environment filled with cameras. The result uh, brings the survivor as a hologram to anyone who wants to ask them questions and understand their life better in the museum itself. And you can kind of see on the uh, left, on the two left images, on the bottom left, that, that is a screenshot from the theater itself in Dallas. <clears throat> the Dimension and Testimony Theater in the museum, uh, this is a place where people can come in and ask the questions and talk to the survivors. So uh, the visitor will ask a certain question. There is a voice recognition software that detects the question, and that will trigger a specific story. Uh, that is directly related to, to the survivor. And of course, you get to experience them uh, telling that story. Um, as this was a fairly complex story to tell, first, we really had to understand the implication of telling someone else's story. We had to make sure that we are telling the story through the eyes of the survivors, portraying the history as it happened. In order to do that, we work very close with our partners at USC, uh, internally, our story leads listen to hundreds and hundreds of hours of these testimonies to be able to do these stories justice and create the three-minute experience that visitors see today. And lastly, we had to understand who the audience is. Uh, from our research and the client research, we understood that the target audience, high school and middle school kids, and that really guided us uh, through the experience and how do we adapt the experience to this age group. Um, NGX's role was to create an introduction and help the visitors understand what the survivors' lives were like before and during World War II by immersing the visitors in the Eastern European home during these periods. So we were asked to recreate a late 1930s home in a virtual environment, and each survivor had their own personal objects and family photos within that environment, as you can probably see on the screenshot right now. So. I'm going to play the show itself. The show is about three and a half minutes. Um, there is audio. You're going to hear the, um, sorry, before that, I should probably tell, uh, the, the show that you're going to see was set up in Unreal Environment. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about that in the following slides. Uh, so again, the show is three and a half minutes uh, around that time. You're going to hear the voice of one of the survivors. Uh, his name is Aaron Elster. Uh, and I will see you right after. I'm Aaron, and I'm a Holocaust survivor. I was born in a town called Sokov Podlaski in Poland. My family was composed, my mom, my dad, my older sister, Irene, my baby sister, whom I loved so dearly, 
Sarah. My grandparents had 12 children. So I was surrounded with cousins and uncles. Were we rich or poor? I really can't tell you. I never needed anything. We used to play on the cobblestones of the street because there was no traffic. There were no cars. If you saw a truck or something pass by, we all used to chase it. The persecution started when the Germans came in, but it progressively got worse. The persecution took on a reality when the ghetto was created. Food was rushed. Housing was a problem. And people disappearing. The only thing I remember is being restricted, having to live in a ghetto, couldn't go outside, couldn't uh, go parts of the town that I used to go to, couldn't go to the marketplace. And food became a problem. My parents did everything they possibly could to try to feed their children. Black market, risking their lives outside the ghetto to buy food and bring it in. Nineteen forty-two was the finality to our lives. With the Gestapo, Ukrainian police, local police surrounded the ghetto and started the final killings. The Gorskis were a couple with no children. Mrs. Gorski was a good friend to my mother and my mother to her. And ultimately, when it came down where everybody was being killed, my mother made arrangements with Mrs. Gorski to place my sister Irene in their home. And subsequently, I came to the house and I was placed in the attic for survival. I survived in the attic for close to two years. Uh, so at this point, the, uh, the front screen is going to um... Uh, going to lift up and the projection uh, within um, uh, within the stage, within the, the, the theater, the hologram is going to appear and then people will be able to talk to the uh, survivor. Just for the spatial context, there are three more uh, screens that uh, show the, the rest of the room. Um, I just didn't want to walk around. I'm sure with the uh, Zoom streaming, it might be a little bit uh, dizzy. So uh, there are total... Uh, this is the immersion that we were talking about, night screens, um, almost 360 around you. A little bit about the uh, the process of uh, how did we develop that uh, that room. So in order to, de to design the environment that you saw, we did an extensive research on personal objects, you can see on the right side, um, and the homes of each survivors. Uh, from the technical point of view, we had to think about the lighting and the atmosphere to tell the story. Um, we knew that the animation was going to be very minimal, as you probably noticed, due to the very short time constraint that we had. We had about uh, six months to produce this. So we had to rely heavily on audio and animation post-production. So just to understand the scope, we had to create 12 of these uh, three and a half minute experiences for 12 survivors. And each animation, as you, can, uh, as you saw, uh, nine different screens, 4K each, so massive amount of content, massive amount of render. So really, really had to think, how do we do this efficiently? How do we do this? A lot of it in, in post. Utilizing VR and Unreal 5 in our production is really the key from the beginning to uh, understand what people are going to, what visitors are going to experience in the museum itself. Um, you know, this is not a typical show that you kind of see on, on the screen or in a movie, you're immersed in it. And a lot of our work is like that. So this is uh, where we create the spaces in uh, Unreal or in Unity. And um, every stage of production is being reviewed either in VR or in Unreal on a computer. So that way the whole team can see the producers, PMs, and the artists. 
And that really helps us understand the space better, uh, the size uh, of objects, the lighting, what people see, what do they experience, side lines, uh, you know, what do you see in the front versus sitting in the back? Is there something blocking your view? Um, and the other thing, we sometimes will go into very fine detail as to um, uh, recreating the lighting in the virtual space because we do get sometimes that information from the client. We know what light bulbs are going to be in the theater and how many of them. So that really helps us understand the space even before, sometimes before it's even built. Uh, a little bit about the, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit about the animation process uh, from concept to development. Uh, this is just the left side of the room. Uh, so the left five screens, so you can see concept, clay render, um, and the um, and the final result. Um, we had to design two stages of everything, one regular and one uh, more abandoned and dilapidated as the people were driven out of their homes, uh, almost frozen in time. For the production itself, we used Mayan zebras for modeling. Uh, Substance uh, was great for uh, texturing and Substance really uh, was super helpful creating these dilapidated objects. Very easy because you can you can create a few materials and you can kind of apply that to other objects, and it gives that natural um, dilapidation, that natural aging. Uh, and you know, speaking from from an artist who started texturing in Photoshop, so Substance was definitely um, an amazing tool. Uh, lighting in my using Redshift. Um, Redshift. Unbelievable render engine, really fast, uh, even with not a supercomputer. Um, the benefits of Redshift is, you know, of course, you can quickly check the lighting. Um, uh, we used AOV passes, and we also used lighting passes. And that was kind of like the first time for me that we used lighting passes. And I'll talk a little bit about them in the next slide. Um, one thing I do have to say is this project was done a couple of years ago. And if we had to do that today, uh, we're slowly shifting our pipeline into Unreal. We would definitely do this in Unreal. Um, as much as Redshift is great, at the end of the day, just the left side of the room, the resolution was about 14, 15,000 by 2,000. Massive renders, right? So if you get a feedback from the client, you get a feedback from the internal team, something small needs to be changed, you have to re-render this again. And um, it's just... It was a bit painful towards the end because the render times are really, you know, you see this on a big 55 inch screen. So you, you, the quality has to be high. Uh, and, you know, with Unreal, it really gives you that ability to be creative from the start. And that's what I really like about it. You're not, you're not breaking your focus. You're not breaking your um, creativity because uh, waiting for the render to happen, even if it's 30 seconds, even if, even if it's one minute, it's all there. And, you know, moving objects in real time. Um, it's just unreal, basically. Um, and of course, you know, helps with client revisions. Um, and for a lot of the models, we actually purchased them. And that's where we, uh, personally, I don't see it as a bad thing because that really gave gave us the ability to focus on lighting and atmosphere and story and the experience rather than having us, you know, modeling the, the, the spokes uh, on a bicycle because it's going to be fairly large right in front of it. For the 2D comp, uh, apologies in advance for all the new users. We've used uh, After Effects to do this comp. Um, we exported still images from, uh, from Maya, except the, the movement of the curtains, which was simulated. Um, and something that I really like are the lighting passes. So as you saw in the experience, there's a lot of um, uh, light flickering off, turning on, turning off. Um, so we were able to export all these passes and we were able to control them in post. When they turn off, how do we time it to the audio, to the voiceover? So it was extremely, extremely helpful. And of course, you know, color correcting each of the lights. That's aside from the uh, usual... AOV passes, you know, reflection, specularity, and glossiness, and, and, and depth, and so on, so on, so on. Um, in conclusion, we feel really honored to be able to help tell these stories, as hard as they may be. It's definitely a challenging process. Um, sometimes that challenge comes not from a technical 
or a production point of view, but rather than from the story and the experience itself. So yeah, so at this point, I want to pass the microphone to Ray Elemento, a very talented 3D motion graphics artist at NGX. Ray, take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Ray Elemento. I am a senior 3D motion graphics artist for NGX. <clears throat> Sorry. I've, I've worked as a freelance 3D generalist in the industry before I joined NGX in the summer of 2021 and have loved tackling the diverse projects of NGX ever since. During my time with here uh, with NGX, I've worked on projects such as Autodesk's gallery situated in their headquarters in San Francisco, the Grand Egyptian Museum, and an upcoming digital experience for Vancouver's BT Biodiversity Museum, just to name a few. <clears throat> as part of my role as a 3D motion graphics artist, I get to create informative and interpretive uh, visuals in an immersive and interactive setting. As an artist, I specialize in abstract to realis realistic animations, particularly particle animations, and I'm very passionate on delivering narrative-driven experiences. NGX has provided me a platform to artistically express myself freely in the multimedia space. Okay, so today I'll, I'll be discussing one of our recent installations for Res uh, Reservoir's global headquarters, Xylem, in Washington, D.C. This project posed many technical challenges, while uh, which called for an adaptive pipeline through its uh, various stages and processes. We'll be going, just a quick overview, we'll be going through just a bit of background of the project, concept animations, the benefits of what we call, uh, what I would token as straight to 3D approach during the design exploration in the concept and planning stages, adaptive pipelines and design considerations going from planning to production, the thought processes when using the 3D programs that we, we use, and just a brief retrospective of the project towards the end. Just to give you a bit of context, NGX was tasked with creating an audio-visual experience that aligned with Reservoir's brand and mission of overcoming critical water and sustainability challenges. We were asked to, we were tasked with developing a large-scale seamless waterfall as a centerpiece situated in the lobby, along with interactive multimedia that has updatable functionality. Here is an animated interactive multimedia piece, uh, which displayed on Reservoir's, which displayed Reservoir's mission statement, as well as, as scheduling and info, which can be edited by the client. This is the, the final waterfall that we delivered that, uh, that is, that is projected on a two story, two story LED panel on a 24 seven loop, which I'll break down in the following slides. In, before we get into the nitty gritty, I'm going to do a quick segue into a concept animation that we created. Just to give you a bit of context, rather than the traditional pipeline of 2D to storyboard to 3D, we found more substance in seeing the pieces we developed in the, in the 3D version of the lobby earlier on in the planning and concept phase of the project, which helped generate more ideas as opposed to conceptualizing in 2D storyboards. So without further ado, I'll just uh, hit play and hope you Hope you enjoy it. So yeah, uh, just uh, this 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 animation wasn't necessary uh, in terms of client validation, but I felt it helped the team gain a better understanding of the space as it presented the interaction of the media in terms of lighting in the space, the size and scale of the centerpiece, how the media uh, might look during the day and night. So there's like that day and night cycle. Uh, also the viewing angles from the inside, outside, from the stairs, first floor and second floor for both the visitors and its uh, employees. 
having this concept animation early on in the planning stages help with directing considerations such as the screen's brightness levels, the coloration of the media, and, and specifically where to place certain focal elements of the waterfall. So 3D concepts and evolutions. After we, res uh, I, I just want to give uh, a quote from one of our uh, creative directors on the project, uh, Jan Berenger. A waterfall is a universal symbol uh, for change and transformation, bringing to life the essence of Xylem's core vision and values. So I'm just going to play this here. So after we received the brief, I went straight to r and d in 3D. Due to the scope and budget of the project, we decided that uh, a realistic approach of the water simulations would be too risky and too costly, um, worrying that it would not achieve high fidelity. So we, so we decided a more realist, uh, stylistic approach of the waterfall. I use Cinema 4D, which is a professional 3D modeling animation and simulation and rendering software paired along with Otoy's Octane Renderer, which is a GPU uh, accelerated, unbiased, physically correct renderer that can achieve photo realistic animations. Um, and yeah, I chose I chose Insidium's Cinema 4, uh, 4D plugin, uh, X Particles, for its robust controls in particle simulations. So, and both programs gave me the tools to accurate, accurately represent realistic lighting with its path tracing rendering capabilities, but posed challenges, which I will allow, elaborate more further in uh, later on in the presentation. We explored variation designs of the waterfall that we categorized into three themes, transformation on the left here, uh, formations on the, this, the middle, and emergence. Transformation, just a brief explanation of each. Transformation explores defining shapes. Formations explores the various textures, texture representations of both water, uh, of both literal and abstract. Emergence explores abstract movements, bringing emphasis on the flow and movement of water. Trans transformation simulates the movement and flow of water with a subtle uh, with subtle changes that follow the conceptual art, a story arc that create a dynamic and changing spatial experience. After referencing real waterfalls, I use particle motion modifiers and colliders to insinuate shapes and definitions as the particles move and collide with invisible objects, as, as such as the rocks that you see um, there. I found this created a vignette that emphasizes the characteristics of water. Formation explores abstracted forms of water uh, when it changes states. The aim was to represent how water has diverse use, uses and takes on different forms, which is the core of Xylem's, uh, Xylem's work. I, I utilize Cinema 4D's MoGraph tools to deform a 3D plane and explore different materials and textures to represent uh, water in both an abstract and literal way. Emergence explores the dynamic, uh, explores dynamically evolving and changing movements, which forms, merges, dissipates when falling down to floors with the subtle changes of speed and density. I use uh, X particles, various motion modifiers such as turbulence and played with its parameters to achieve more abstract motion in the particles in comparison to the first category, uh, which was transformation. So this one, mostly explore just just uh, movements rather than being included or, or colliding with anything. While exploring uh, transformation formations and emergence, I found Cinema 4D and X Particles did not give me the flexibility to iterate the design to meet the revision and, uh, and feedback uh, timeframes due to the nature of particle simulations. I I would have had to wait long render times, not to mention the amount of generated particles meant long processing times if you don't have access to a supercomputer, as Alex mentioned before, or a, like or a render farm, or if like if you're a freelancer as well or in a small team, you'd you'd want speed basically. The delivery was for a three minute loop of a waterfall, which meant working in Cinema 4D was not ideal for the final delivery or production. As many of you know, live feedback in any creative design process is ideal when it comes to fluidity and efficiency in your workflow. 
as we were still in the planning and concept phase, I did not want to limit ourselves to long wait times. So I quickly researched other viable programs and plugins, which uh, yielded faster results. Luckily, I, I came across a third party program called Embergen, developed by Jenga FX, which is also packaged with Otoyo's Octane Render. So it's kind of hidden within their uh, 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 sub uh, subscription packages. Embergen specifically generates particles and vol vol volumetric simulations with blazing fast results in their viewport. With its node-based user interface, I was quick to transition to the software, which gave me ability to change the design instantaneously and found what worked and didn't work a lot quicker. How however, Embergen did not provide all the solutions to the project, uh, but did solve a prominent issue, which was the long wait times. So, And working in an adap adaptive pipeline allowed me to utilize both C4D and Embergen for various sections of the project, y using different softwares for the various stages early in the planning stage was a major consideration going to production as knowing the strengths and weaknesses of each provide proficient, well-formed, best use case scenarios um, for deliveries moving forward. We explored uh, different color shifts that change throughout the animation loop. Uh, the shifts are subtle over the course of the animation, expressing the range of light, color, temperatures over the course of the loop while keeping consistent with the rhythm and flow of the waterfall. We also brought in a sound uh, engineer to design a soundscape that complemented the waterfall um, very well. So it, it the end one the end coloration wasn't uh, as harsh as this, but this was just to give you a uh, just give you a glimpse of the type of uh, design processes that we go through. I utilized Cinema 4D and Octane to generate these still frames for animation within a 3D version of the lobby to provide an accurate representation of how the brightness of the screens interacted with the space, as well as show how it may look during the day and night from various angles, as well as provide the team with an overall sense of scale and space. These stills provided uh, considerations for settings in the screen brightness for the on-site AV team who installed the waterfall and screens as we were worried the size of the screen may be overexposed, may overexpose the space. And this was necessary as the animation will be running 24 seven and we didn't want to you know, blind the visitors or especially the lobby receptionists will be working in there for long periods of time. We used a 3D software called Twin Motion, which is an architectural visualization tool that utilizes Unreal Engine developed by Epic Games. Yeah. It enables designers to quickly and easily create high quality images, panoramas, fly-throughs, and oh, I'll just go back here. Animations, uh, sorry, fly-throughs through, fly, fly -throughs and animations. I dropped both the lobby model and the animation to Twin Motion and its live viewport rendering allowed me to, allowed me and the team to view the full playback both of the waterfall and the multimedia screens in pretty much real time. Twin motion, twin motion does render, does have a path tracing option, but it also has long render times. However, it provides screen space global illumination or SSGI rendering, which simulates results close to the traditional path tracing engine. This helped us further iterate the animation, specifically where to have density. Uh, I'll just move back here. Have where to have density, density, and the focal elements, as we were able to see the sections of the screen which would be included by the stairs. For the multimedia screens, we use Cinema 4D um, and Octane along with X Particles for the ambient animated background particle loops for the attractive and multimedia screens, as you can see here. I animated reservoirs, the reservoir and Xylem's logo animation using Octane's Scatter Cloner. Uh, along with motion effectors to achieve the fact that the logos were resolving from floating particles. And then again, sorry to, for the new uh, compositors out there, I layered and composited it all in a three minute loop in Adobe After Effects. We then exported the waterfall animation for the first and second floor as separate screen inputs as they will be playing on a, on a bright sign media player. So, and then 
Our team then ran a two-third scale projection prototype in the NGX headquarters um, in Vancouver to test an early version of the waterfall animation on a bright time media player, just for quality assurance in the playback. And here, here, here are some shots of the final waterfall installed in the space. I feel that the reflective surfaces of the materials and the walls and the furnishing really filled the space uh, with the blue hues and the yellow highlighted and um, took away too much of the harshness that the, the blue might be overpowering the space. Here we have uh, some pictures of our um, the amazing work of our tech development team on the multimedia room for, um, and its functionalities on the left here. Overall, the team tackled many design challenges and obstacles, specifically during the design iteration stages, but the final delivery was, a, I feel, was a great success. We found concepting and designing straight in 3D very early on in the planning stage um, allowed for a smoother development of the waterfall animation, um, as well as transitioning into production the production stage. Using the adaptive pipeline approach over the traditional 2D concept to the storyboard to the 3D saved a lot of time and effort in generating iterations and rendering for the final delivery, which aligned well with the scope and budget of the project. What I took away from the project is that limiting yourself to the tools you're comfortable with closes off the possibilities of improving your workflow and output as uh, a designer and artist. And as technology uh, progresses, will the, these like render times or these like challenges will become more become more of a thing of the past. Since the first uh, Xylem project, we were further ta uh, further tasked to create a seasonal version of Xylem's waterfall, and found that using Unreal Engine and its Niagara system to generate particle animations yielded subjectively greater results. At results at a fraction of the work time. In comparison, the snowfall particle you see here um, was developed in roughly four to five working days with a render times of 30 minutes per three minute loop, as opposed to the four month production process of the original waterfall. We are currently using Unreal Engine 5 in a lot of our new projects and will most likely use it for future projects as its developers are catering more and more of Unreal Engine 5's functionalities to the uh, TV and film industry. Having said that, I we're, we're not limiting all our projects to Unreal Engine 5 and we'll use Cinema 4D and other uh, familiar 3D programs on a case-by-case -case basis. Working in an adaptable pipeline uh, for this project, going back into this project, um, yielded even amazing results when it comes to efficiency in tackling our design challenges from start to finish. So with this uh, with this design specifically, I was uh, able to sit with my director and instead of receiving feedback and then making the changes and coming back um, and presenting them and then you know going through the whole process again, I could sit down and just um, make the changes pretty much live in like a meeting setting. So that's just the power of Unreal Engine 5. So in, uh, in conclusion, uh, I, I feel honored to have been a part of this project, exploring new to tools and dynamic creative approaches to design challenges as an artist and in an, a team environment. Uh, I'm super excited for the future projects of NGX. And yeah, it's just, it's just really awesome to be able to discover these programs and just really dig deep, um, play around and see what see where these programs could take us and the things that the amazing things that we can create. So with that in mind, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> and I will now pass the uh, mic back to the lovely Fran. Thanks, Ray. Uh, and thanks, Alex. And thank you, Spark and Marina for having us here. This has been amazing. Hopefully everyone has enjoyed our presentation and had the chance to learn a little bit more about what we do at NGX and who we are. Uh, at this point, I'd love to open the floor to questions. Yeah, we already have some questions that uh, Alex has answered in the Q&A, so you can look there for some answers. But we have a couple of other questions that we were going to get to. And I'm going to start a little bit further down the line because I think these tie into what Ray was just talking about. And Ray, this one is specific to you and the work that you were doing with the particles. Mitchell says, have you tried running particle systems in Blender? 
I actually have not. So I, I, I've, I've dived a bit deep into Blender when I first started, but you know, as a f- freelancer, you either, <laughs> you either choose Cinema 4D or Blender, but um, I know there are amazing artists out there that can just switch on between the two, but I, I felt it's pretty comfortable early in Cinema 4D, and then I, I discovered X Particles fairly early as well, and I would love to dive into Blender, um, but right now I'm I'm very much exploring a lot of the Niagara systems and the particles that can be generated in that in in that engine, um, and yeah, also like the 5.1 update has some amazing new uh, features in Unreal. But I would to- I would totally jump into Blender. I know it has some amazing capabilities and like pretty much can do everything. Well, it's it's interesting when you talk about the fact that, um, you know, you have, the projects are all so different and the approach that you take to creating each one is so different. So having a pipeline that is open and, you know, you're able to modify and use different tools clearly is very helpful, but I'm assuming it probably comes with some difficulties as well. Can you talk about some of the challenges and maybe some of the advantages of your pipeline? Myself or uh, uh, anyone? <laughs> I can, uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I can talk a, a little bit about it. the uh, The biggest challenge is that um, so I've been in EGX the past six years, um, and when I started, sort of just like I was the animation department, and from the beginning, I was trying to bring uh, my knowledge from the linear pipeline from the animation, you know, shotgun, uh, shot grid right now. It just it just never fit. It just we were thinking about okay, we have this project, but then we have uh, uh, we have the tech with Unity combined with animation. We have two D within the three D space. It was just all over the place, but in a good way. Um, so that's where we just kind of have to rewrite a little bit the pipeline from the beginning. And especially now with some of the projects, we currently we have a project where we're using. Uh, motion tracking, we're using Touch Designer, Unreal, Unity, Cinema 4D, uh, probably Maya in some way. So that's where the challenge is like, you know, it just, it's almost like opening a blank page. It's like, okay, how do we do that? Um, so that's kind of like the, the biggest challenge. And of course, the more artists you have on the project, the more challenging it becomes because you have to, you have to make sure that everyone just kind of like plugs in into that pipeline versus, you know, coming to a visual effects studio, you got a computer, you plug into struggle, you get your shots and, and everybody's happy. Um, but the exciting part of that, like at least for me, you know, I lost all my problems. Got these like six different solvers, how they're going to communicate with each other, how we, all the artists around the world are going to work on that. So then we, you know, we try to figure out how do we work together? So this is where we meeting with, uh, with our tech department, uh, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, just kind of like developing as we go. And just to add to that, that's the strength of as much as it can be uh, uh, not a risk, but uh, difficulties in adding in more people into your pipeline. They also bring their own skills and their own knowledge, too. Like there's so much cross pollination for teaching each other new skills and new software. And if someone sees or finds something, it's like, hey, have you guys tried this? It just spreads across the animation department very quickly saying, like, let's try it. Oh, this works. OK, let's let's implement it as fast as we can. One of the things that um, I thought was really interesting is the fact that, you know, the projects are all so different. Uh, Victoria has an interesting question as well. And she was talking, you both mentioned the space and how the space itself was exp- was important. Uh, like Alex, you were talking a little bit about how you guys knew about the, the lights that they were going to be using in the space. And Ray, you were talking a little bit about, you know, making sure that the the, the light in that space didn't blind the receptionist or the people that were coming in the front door. Do you actually have any control over what those spaces look like um, when you start developing these projects? Uh, We do, yes. And I actually, I saw that that question from Victoria and I really Mm -hmm. like the question because we, that is where um, we're not just, we're not executioners, right? We're not, we don't get like the project and we're just like, okay, just do it like that. From the beginning, we do workshops. We fly all over the world to meet with the client to understand the space even before it's built. We have the ability to read the blueprints of the space um, and suggest and really work with them and say, it's like, hey, guys, look at this mock-up in Unreal based on the blueprints. We know the space is not built yet, but take a look. This might be a problem. A really good example is the uh, the Holocaust Museum 
one of the things the client didn't notice is there uh, there was a wall um, that was blocking the view from some of the people, and we only discovered it in Unreal. So we mentioned it to the client. So lighting, all the stuff, and sometimes we, uh, well, all the time we go for installations for these exhibits, and uh, to be able to understand the space even better, and if need be, adjust some of the um, some of the visuals. <laughs> And that ties actually into a question that I had, and that was, you know, when projects come to you, how much information do you get up front? Like, do you know um, that it's going to be an installation? Do you know what what's involved, like what aspects that they want the client wants to see? Or do they just come with to you with an idea of what they may want to see? And then you brainstorm ideas that are then presented and then you fine tune from there. Like, how what does that process look like? It yeah, looks Fran like loves this question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a very big part of my job right now. It, it looks like a thousand page PDF document that has every single detail and and idea that could go into it. And often enough, they're they're very descriptive, sometimes over descriptive or sometimes very, very clinical and very factual. And a part of our, our goal is to find the, the creativity and the art inside of it as well. And to pare down that information to something that is also, you know, emotional or impactful or interesting. And they, they give us so much detail of the space and the tools we're going to use and what they're looking for. And we have the opportunity to, to transform that into something that's, that's really, really cool. So yeah, we, there's never a lack of information. Um, however, there's always those things you find in the cracks in between too. And that's that's part of the the difficulty in having such a, a large amount of information is there's always something in there that it's like, has anyone thought of this? And then we bring it back to them and say, no, they ha we haven't thought about that. And it just becomes a discussion point from there. But yeah, there's no lack of information for sure. Um, Al asks, do you automatically build in accessibility option or options or is that determined by the customer ask or scope? Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, accessibility is a massive part of what we do uh, all the way from the beginning. So we have uh, uh, UX designers, we have UI designers, animators, like everybody understands um, um, some of this from documentation specific accessibility um, um, uh, limitations. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, but sometimes when we, de when we design uh, physical, uh, something physical, something people, something that people would be using. We always we have all the, the documentation uh, from the clients or from ourselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, uh, and like I said, our team is very knowledgeable. So we all of this we take into consideration. And that's that's one of the powerful things about us building things in in a virtual space as well is it can reveal so many things that you may not consider like the height of a podium and you're considering oh there may be someone in a wheelchair here oh they can't see that we need to angle this we need to lower it or from this height or from this place there's light in the eyes or there's a color contrast or there's noise pollution or everything else so creating virtual spaces and being able to walk through them is a huge tool for figuring out accessibility as well Unreal is, so, is something that comes up all the time, not just in your industry, but like across the entire CG universe. But, you know, there was a time when we didn't have these tools. But, I mean, can you talk a little bit about, you know, sort of the future of um, the industry and the tools that are out there and how somebody that maybe has just graduated that doesn't really know where to start um, you know, they have tools that they've learned in school, but they may not be immediately transferable to what you're doing in an actual job. So what would you recommend to folks that are looking to sort of like either upgrade or learn something that will be useful in their day-to-day -day at, at a job? Uh, yeah, right. No, please take it. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a hard question. Take it, take it. Yeah. It is, it is. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot as well, but if I like looking back, um, if I had known like what to look up first i would highly recommend thinking uh looking up fundamentals um uh and terminologies within the 3d space and animation so i when i first went into 3d i loved every second of it so i i just chomped down on tutorials found any free uh tutorials uh, on youtube um i played it all in like two times speed listened out for all the terminologies that because pretty much on all 3d programs you have the same 
like uh, wordings on like bulls or like extruding, like the modeling techniques, like like just just the wording, like ray uh, path tracing and all that. Um, and like moving into the industry, what you may learn in institutional or like in uh, in in school may not, since the industry just keeps evolving, it may not translate straight away. But the terminologies and the uh, the way you explain processes in 3D are pretty much almost the same throughout each 3D program. So as long as you know the processes, um, if you could teach yourself the terminologies, you can pretty much find how to do everything in 3D just by searching those words and yeah, those key words pretty much. So that's how that's what I would do. Um, instead of getting into too much detail of every single process, just know the overall process and just find ways to find what you're trying to look for because there's always documentation because if you've had the problem somebody else has already come across it pretty much yeah the one thing that i, I do want to add to that because um you know this question came up um from one of our artists at the studio um we all of us got into unreal for the uh, for the past year and we had to dive in quick uh on a project itself so um one of our artists is very passionate about just knowing everything about Unreal and blueprints and sequence and animation and lighting and modeling. And, um, you know, my recommendation, <clears throat> if you are getting into Unreal, um, Unreal is like a bottomless pit of, of knowledge and creativity. If you're going to try and say, it's like, okay, I want to be great at blueprints. I want to be great at this. I want to be great at that. It's really difficult. It's really challenging. Focus on what you like. Don't focus on what the company is looking for you because you want to be working for a company and you want to do work that you like. Um, and I think that is the key. So if you like lighting, like Ray said, understand the terminology, photography, how the light works around, the, you know, in the world, interior, exterior, apply the knowledge in, in Unreal. Um, and if for some reason you're going to work for a company where Okay, we only use Maya for lighting, but they see the lighting real and unreal. And there's a fundamental understanding of how lighting works. Like I said, it's easy to translate that knowledge because you know the terminology. It's just a matter of like, where's the where is it on the toolbar? And we'll finish with this question from Ren. Uh, could you expand a little bit more on multiple hats? And if there's an opportunity at NGX to step in and learn, say, FX, if she's coming from a character animation background or layout background? Um, yeah, I can. Uh, I know I answered Ren uh, for the first question that was, um, yeah, the first question, what, what do we look in animators who want to apply for a position of NGX, years experience and so on? So, um, because our team is small, we the artists that, that we have in house, they wear multiple hats. So it doesn't mean that if you're a character animator, you're also going to do concept art, you're also going to do particle animation. It means that if you're a motion graphic artist, the range of motion graphics artists that you're going to do ranges from basic 2D to super complex 3D. And uh, when we're looking for any artist, we're always asking to set any additional work. Uh, do you paint? Do you do storyboards in your free time? Do you like to take photography? Because for us, it's really important to understand how creative the person is and how can they contribute to our team? Because what Fran said at the beginning of the presentation, we're not cogs. We participating in conceptual design and ideation. Pretty much everyone that participates on a project from the beginning. So we're really trying to understand um, uh, the uh, what creative abilities that person has, and in terms of um, sorry, I'm just going to go back to this uh, question that you just closed. No. Uh, in terms of uh, learning effects, I mean, <clears throat> if we're going to be hiring for a certain position, for example, a character animator, uh, that means that we have pretty much full time to do character animation um the there's always that um uh, not just an option like a possibility where um we can schedule some time uh for example working with ray maybe once a week maybe twice a week just to kind of like show if the person wants to get into effects but
But if we're going to be looking for someone who does character animation, they're primarily going to be doing character animation. Guys, it's been so, so informative and so wonderful having you join us. Thank you so much, Fran, Ray, and Alex for this really informative and really fantastic presentation. It was really, really fun. I really cannot thank you enough for sharing a little bit more about your work and what you guys do. And the fact that um, you are working in so many disciplines, uh, it's amazing what goes into the work that you do because it is not just animation VFX. There's so many different things involved and it's really fantastic to get a bit of an inside look behind the scenes of what goes into creating these installations, which are now kind of everywhere. And often we walk by them and don't even notice that they're there. They're just part of the environment. And that in itself is an amazing achievement. So congratulations, that's awesome. So thank you again for your time. It's been really, really wonderful. Thank you thank so you much for having us. Thank you, thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to also take a moment to thank our sponsors again. We wouldn't be able to do these events without them. Our Terabyte sponsor, Creative BC. Our Megabyte sponsors, Animal Logic and Capilano University. Our Kilobyte sponsors, Atomic Cartoons, Braun, DNEG, Image Engine, Industrial Light and Magic, and Mainframe Studios. Our Byte sponsors, CMPABC, DigiBC, Scanline VFX, The Little Dev Shop, and the Vancouver Film School, and our partners, ACM SIGGRAPH. And again, a reminder, we do these webinars on a fairly regular basis, so be sure to sign up to our newsletter at sparkcg.org to be notified of when these events are happening. And of course, SparkFX is around the corner, so stay tuned. Announcements for that are coming very, very soon. Thank you guys again so much, and we hope to see you again soon, hopefully in person next time.